Nintendo permits, Marvel dining experience, and we talk to Mike Aiello about the holidays at Universal Orlando Resort on episode 277 of the unofficial Universal Orlando podcast. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the show. My name is Darren, of course, and joining me, Tracy. Hello, everyone. And Lee. Hello, everyone. You and still found it a bit awkward there, didn't you, Darren, with that intro? Because you wanted to say, welcome to the unofficial Universal Orlando podcast, but we've yep. already done that, so I just and need to repeat. say, sure. <laughs> <laughs> now I wanted to repeat the show number and everything else again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So uh, how's everybody doing? Good. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Really e- good. Excited yeah. to share our interview with uh, with Mike. It, oh, was, yes. it was awesome. Epic. Yeah. 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 Bum- bummer I couldn't be there for it, but... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, when when Mike Aiello has time, you you do it. Right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and the plan is at some point in the future to do a show from that broadcast studio. Having talked to Bob, the guy who yeah. was recording their side of it, he's like, "You should do it in the studio sometime." I was like, "I would absolutely love to." Yes. That's that's oh, that that's a, cool. a crack in the door to get in. Can you imagine that's... the three of us sat in that studio with Mike Aiello across from us? I think we I'd wouldn't be able to actually draw. speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, yeah. It'd That'd be, be awesome. Cool. Join yes. the producers club and get Lee and Tracy over here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey Darren, happen. there's nothing stopping you doing it. Oh yeah, I'll just I'll just go ahead and bum mm-hmm. right on in there. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, well, cool. we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my extreme nervousness. I think oh. the thing you're going to need from down there. And walk in the dawn. <laughs> 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 That's how I feel before every interview. I do mm. feel the show's gone on a tangent. Yeah. Already. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know how it goes. Well, let's get back <laughs> on track with some Producers Club birthdays. It's a busy one this month. It is. It is indeed. Right. Oh, and they're all the end of the month. So, we're fast forwarding all the way to the 21st of December. And that is a lovely Alicia Stella's birthday. Ah, yes. yes. Happy birthday, Alicia. Happy birthday. I have to say, laser designators acted. <laughs> <laughs> and then on Christmas Day, the 25th, just in case you don't know when it is, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's Donna Pierce's birthday. Happy birthday, happy birthday, Donna. Yes, happy birthday, Donna. Yes. For having a Christmas birthday. Yes. It's a terrible time to yes, happy birthday. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, and December the 29th, it is the inimitable Mr. Craig Lucas's birthday. Oh, God. Happy birthday, oh, Craig. Boy. <laughs> happy birthday, I Craig. Feel that energy from here. <laughs> happy birthday, Craig. And then it's John Herkov's birthday on December the 30th. Happy birthday, John. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Followed by the lovely Maureen Deal's birthday Aww. on New Year's Eve, December the 31st. Oh. Happy birthday, Maureen. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. What a cool birthday. Yeah. I know. I like that one. Yes. And not forgetting, on the 23rd, it is Lee's birthday. Oh, Happy course. birthday, Lee. Thank you. Happy birthday. I would be remiss in not mentioning that it is Tracy's birthday on the 22nd yes, as well. It is. <laughs> Happy birthday, Tracy. Thank you, Darren. Yes. Happy birthday. And we have just missed, uh, although he's still with us in spirit, he's not yes. here anymore. Mr. Hunter Fagan's birthday was very recently as well. So if yes. you're listening, buddy, happy birthday. Yes. Happy yes, birthday, happy birthday, for birthday my friend. Yes. Jesus, a veritable yes. birthday feast. It is. I do feel, you see, this is another reason for us to go over for Christmas. Yes. What a birthday party we could have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. literally sort of like <clears throat> eight or nine people within the space of, what, ten days? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought All we your were... parents planned this <laughs> so that they didn't have to get double gifts. <laughs> <laughs> Always remember that. <laughs> mm. Some of them were just more on the mark than others. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Donna's especially. Well, Donna, yeah. I was actually due on Christmas Day. <laughs> but, oh, <yeah. laughs> but the story goes that I overheard what my name was going to be being born on Christmas Day, so I came early. <laughs> Noel. Noel. Oh, my God. Oh, boy. Yes. And, oh, and, I'm glad that didn't happen. Carol and Holly were still toyed with. Oh, no. <laughs> they're awful. Yes. Well, they're not. Yeah. They're just not me. Well, hey, at least so. you weren't Lee. He was going to be Rudolph, so. <laughs> I'm not going to share what my name actually was going to be. 
but it was I, uh, know. It, I was I was going to be named after and part of my name still is that uh, a, a famous martial art actor from the 70s and You're that's all Shared, I'm but saying. You are I haven't oh, said yeah. it though <laughs> okay, I think, I think we might be able to infer. From there. And I'm so glad that they didn't, because my life would have been hell. Yeah. You mean it's not a, now? As a little fat child, they wouldn't have gone down well. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh man, oh, bless me to Darlow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, happy birthday again to everybody. Yes. yes. Happy birthday and a merry Christmas as well. Yeah. No, we yes. never, ever, ever tie birthdays <laughs> and Christmas is. together. No, we don't tie birthdays and Christmas together. <laughs> he learns nothing. I'll slap him later. It's fine. Oh, boy. <sighs> All right, let's keep the uh, good vibes going with the spew. Ooh. Uh, and that is from Brittany Berger this time. Uh, she says, unfortunately, I didn't catch the name of the team member because it was dark outside at Halloween Horror Nights, but I wanted to share this story. A group behind us in line for Scarecrow the Reaping were smoking in line, and my friend was starting to react negatively to the smoke. I told the team member about the situation, and he told him to stop. The team member noticed that the moment he walked away, the person lit up again. Uh, After this, the team member called over another person to make them put it out. He then turned to us and told us that he wanted to talk to us out of the line quickly. We were then escorted to the front of the line for the inconvenience the smoking had caused my friend. It was a small deed, but greatly appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. It just shows it That's doesn't nice. have to be something major just to make a difference because no. they didn't have to do that. No. Right. Yeah, and that and that does suck. Um, the the lines are so long, people are drinking and everything. Mm-hmm. It's it, it, it's something that needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, big time in there. I think they need to have more people just watching the lines in general mm-hmm. for that kind of thing because it's pretty obvious when you have people in like a corral of a line. When you see a big puff of smoke or something come up, you can probably identify who it is and get them out of there pretty yeah, quickly. Yeah. And it doesn't seem to happen that often. So, because smoking um, in the actual but, parks, Darren, still it still has to be the designated smoking area. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, it's supposed to be. But during horror nights, it seems like people just kind of go free for all with it. <laughs> what about the e cigs? Uh, that is just always everywhere. Because they can tell them, like, okay, you can't do that here, and they just put it away, and mm. they can just take it out of their pocket the next second and do it again. Yeah. So. But is that supposed to be treated the same as normal smoking? It's, su- it's supposed to, yeah. yeah. And yeah. it'd still be nice because, yeah, that whatever, whether or not it's as dangerous or not as dangerous, uh, it still went through your lungs and stuff, and yeah. I just don't want that on me. Thanks. <laughs> no, totally. Yeah, I know. I know everybody else's breath is on me already, but I can see that one. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. It's like no, I'm, huge, I'm amazed the clouds of smoke. It's horrendous. Yeah. Well, especially so. when you find out that certain ones now are actually called causing popcorn lung. It's quite scary. Mm. So. Yeah, you gotta. Yeah, just be yeah. courteous with that kind of thing. It is because you don't know who's asthmatic around you or anything like that either. So no, you don't want to cause people can die from asthma, so you don't want to cause that for somebody. <laughs> And sometimes so. I just don't want to smell cotton candy, cinnamon bun, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's get off this because I could go on a huge oh, tangent I know. with this. Yes. But yes. Yeah. So. But yes, that was anyway, a, that's, that was a, yeah, that was a nice thing. Was, yeah. Yeah, and good to see that a team member, you know, was paying attention to that kind of thing. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Excellent. So let's uh, let's go ahead and move right along to the new Marvel dining experience. Tracy, you have some info on that for us? I do indeed. I'm quite excited about this one. Yes, it wasn't what I was expecting. <laughs> no. Uh, so Universal Orlando have announced that beginning on Thursday, December the 7th. So that's Thursday this week. Yep. Uh, guests will be able to enjoy a dinner buffet. Dinner, not breakfast. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. With their favourite heroes at the all-new Marvel character dinner. Um, in case meeting these characters in person isn't enough to ignite your excitement, you'll also indulge in a menu created specifically for this new experience. Cool. Um, this is located in Cafe 4 in Marvel Superhero Island uh, in Islands of Adventure. Uh, the dinner buffet will feature Captain America, Spider-Man, Wolverine, Cyclops, Storm and Rogue. So all the hero characters that you can see yeah. in Marvel Superhero Island. So mm-hmm. yeah, um, each character will come to your table to sign autographs and take photos, which is great because it'll make sure that they get around every table so everybody gets an yeah. equal opportunity. That's brilliant. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and 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 what better way to share this epic experience with your friends, bragging rights apparently, uh, than with one digital photo from my Universal Photos, which is included in the experience. That's not bad, actually. Okay. Oh, I haven't got the price yet. So you don't know. Hang on. 
I do know. I know how much it is. I know. Well, anyway. <laughs> so foods you can enjoy are fresh salads like orzo and mozzarella and tomato. Yum. Um, yeah. There's also roasted rosemary and lemon chicken. Ooh. Shrimp scampi. Chicken scallopini. That's just to name a few. <laughs> What's that? I don't know. <laughs> just chicken scalps. Alopini. Did you say scalps? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. They're chicken scalps. Alopini. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is also a uh, penny bolognese, which um, stuffed jumbo shells. I assume that's pasta shells. And yeah. specialty pizzas are the perfect option for any superhero. And of course, they haven't forgotten dessert. There are a heroic portion of assorted desserts to end your meal and the sweetest of notes. Now, heroic to me means you're a hero if you manage to finish it, so there better be big ones. Oh, lots of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, Marvel, the Marvel character dinner is available uh, Thursday to Sunday, 5pm five till, 5 till 7pm. It's dinner. Obviously. Yeah. yeah. Uh, reservations are recommended and can be made online or by calling 407 224 Food, which is 3663. This experience is one that any Marvel fan will not want to miss. And if that sounds like it's good for you, prices are forty nine ninety nine for adults and twenty four ninety nine for kids aged three to nine. That's dollars, not pounds. That is expensive. Mm. Yes, it's expensive. Yeah. Is it all you Did can they... eat? Um, yeah. You said buffet, so... I you yeah, would assume so. so. Oh, I could for eat 50 price, bucks worth of food. really should be, because I think the Grinch character breakfast and everything was like 20 or 30, like 25 Twenty four ninety nine, right? Maybe. Mm. And that one, I mean, that wasn't a buffet, but that you know, that was like one plate of food. So, if you're going to pay double that, I'd hope it was a buffet. <laughs> oh yeah, because you've got to think like the uh, the breakfast at Cafe La Bamba. That wasn't an all you can eat. It was like you no. picked what you picked a set breakfast. But then it would never said buffet. That was the difference. It was no. a character breakfast, whereas <clears throat> that specifically says yeah. Buffet. buffet. Yeah, yeah. What I would like to see for this price as well is after you've stuffed yourself. Guests get a choice of front of the line for either Doctor Doom or the Hulk. <laughs> no. <laughs> An express pass to ride either of them two. Yeah, My... <laughs> a special extended version of Doctor Doom's Fearful. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, the Grinch one's $35 for adults and $21 for kids. Oh, okay. We must have just snuck in as children then. It's probably gone up in price a lot over the next few years. Yeah, and I think we had like an annual pass holder discount when we went or something uh-huh. as well. Yeah. <clears throat> See, my issue with this is, obviously, when when we announced the other week on the show that we'd heard that uh, the Café La Bamba breakfast was closing to make way for an all-new dining experience, that was obviously this. But I don't understand why they can't have one in each park. Why do you have to close one in one park to open one in the other Make, you've got but to also put that, one's breakfast, one's dinner. But even just put that competition yeah. there for people to still choose it's options. People, I, people will probably do both. And I don't understand why. Um, why it's yeah, only I a couple know. of days? Why it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? Why just do it all week? People will do it. Yeah, there's no down season now. Especially, so. especially something like Marvel, because everyone like everyone knows that Disney, Marvel's Disney now. But if you've got kids who want to go and have breakfast or a meal with those characters, mm-hmm. you've got to go to Universal. So that's something you can't do on Disney property. Yeah. Hmm. I was hoping that we were going to see characters that weren't the usual ones in Marvel Superhero Island. Yeah. But and, was, and you have some villains in there too. Yeah, I, I was just going to yeah, say I'm the surprised same. They haven't. Where's the villains meals? Because I would be all over that. Because I think if you talk yeah. to most people, the, the better interaction you have with the characters in Marvel Superhero Island are Doctor Doom and the Green Goblin. Yeah. Yeah. Especially the Green Goblin. He called me a loser last time I was there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Spider-Man's so 10 bucks for that. Too. Yes, that's true. Like we, yeah, we spent a lot of time with Spider-Man at the yeah. Confisco breakfast. Yeah, having a, having yeah. a proper conversation. Yeah, and that's the thing. <laughs> that's what I like about this. I've said as, a, as, a, as an, an older family... When you start doing character meet and greets with characters that can't talk, I, personally, I find it awkward, and I think the kids do a little bit as well. Whereas this, because they're all face characters, you can actually have mm-hmm. an interaction mm-hmm. with them, and it's not just miming and a bit of mucking around. You can actually have a conversation, and those characters are great. Yeah, Spider Man wasn't well, too I... bright though, was he? You keep <laughs> saying was... that all the time. Well, he was asking us about driving the car. Well, he's not over British. What, I know, but what he thought was. The pedals were 
where they are on the side, like on the left-hand side, like they are in an American car. <laughs> But the steering wheel was on the right hand side, like they I are don't over here. That. And I can, oh, it's never left me. And it was just kind of like, you know, you just think, are you actually being serious? He doesn't need to drive a car, does he? He no, just web slings about. Webs, yeah. <laughs> what is it? I was like, right. Oh, that's funny. Bless him. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing I was wondering about, though, uh, you know, Spider Man is probably the one character that kids can recognize, but the other ones, like, you have to tell kids like young kids when you go to islands of adventure like which character that is supposed to be cap i think they, they would do. do yeah oh possibly i guess that that one's yeah. pretty close to but yeah i but agree like, with the other ones you know, like with the comic book things and and things like that yeah w- at what point is going to be where it, like it's like totally bypasses and the kids have no idea who these people are especially like wolverine mm-hmm yeah, it looks thing. nothing like he does in the movies. Yeah. No, know? but that's the movie's fault, really, not the comic. You know, that is Wolverine from the comic books. Yeah. I've got to admit, right. though, every but time I, I understand what you're saying, yeah. Every time we walk past Storm and Rogue, I have to work out which one's which. Eh? Huh? I know, but I'm just... You don't care? No. <laughs> I have a friend of the show, Daryl, who's a huge Marvel fan, and uh, he, uh, he came, they came over, and him and Liam went over in... They went over for Horror Nights, didn't they? And he, mm-hmm. the the guy playing, I'm sure it was Cyclops, recognised him from going over last year. <laughs> and that's, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because he's such a big Marvel geek, and obviously yeah. Daryl's a big lad. He's a big bloke as well, so big, bald bloke, isn't he? So yeah. because he'd had so much interaction with him, the, the um, <laughs> Cyclops had remembered him from last year, and he was he was geeking that's out awesome. when he came mm-hmm. back. Yeah. Yeah. But no, but I think it's, it's good. Uh, yeah, this whole, this whole thing's pretty interesting. It seems yeah. like the menu that they have selected there seems to gear more towards like the adult end of things too, mm-hmm. doesn't yeah. it? Like, so uh, it seems like this is more like a like an adult oriented kind of thing. I mean, sure, it's fine for kids, not a problem at all. There's enough there that they will enjoy. But mm-hmm. yeah, the the options that you had there, especially you know chicken scalps, I don't think kids are really into that. Yeah, because I don't think it's any. I, as far as I can think of at Universal, as far as character meals go, I don't think they've ever done a non-breakfast meal. I can't think of They're always breakfasts, aren't mm-hmm. they? And even mm-hmm. the, the majority of them at Disney are, are breakfasts. Yeah. And yeah, it's great. That area is really nice in the evening as well, so it's nice to see them utilize that. And, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, well, at least in the winter, it'll be getting dark yeah. while you're in there. And yeah. then you can see Marvel Superior Island at night, which is really nice. It is. Yeah. I love that. I like all the neon and stuff. Yeah. 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 No, I think it'll, I think it'll be a hit. I don't think they'll have any trouble filling it up. All right. Excellent. All right. Well, let's go ahead and move on to a Did You Know with Mouse and Muggle. Hey, guys, this is Robin and Michelle from Mouse and Muggle Travel Company with another great did you know tip. Hey, Michelle, did you know that you can have a transfer to and from Universal Orlando to the Walt Disney World Resorts? I did not know this. Yes. So it can be added on to your package, whether you're doing a hotel stay, tickets only, whatever it may be. Um, You can speak to your wonderful travel agent and they can add it on. So you don't have to worry about getting back and forth. So if you're at Universal for a few days and decide you wanna go over and visit the mouse for a little bit, or vice versa, (laughs) you can have a wonderful transfer from Quick Transportation. It does cost about $52 per person, but they will, it's your own transfer. So they'll pick you up at your location and drop you off at the other location. So between the two. <laughs> have you, you've never done this before, Michelle? I haven't done it because I usually have my car. Um, yeah, you're a driver. Most, most of my clients are from my area as well. So they, most of them drive too. But I'm sure this will be great for those um, that fly in like you. Um, mm-hmm. Because when you rent a car, although that is an option, you do have to pay parking fees at the, at the resorts if you're staying at a, at a universal resort or at the um, parks. So this is a good way to kind of skip that fee and just kind of have your own private transportation service. Right. Yeah, very good. I think it's a great option that many people don't know about. Me too. And I, I, you know, I, feel, I would feel safer with that than Uber. I know a lot of people do Uber, but some people don't mm-hmm. feel comfortable with that. So this is a good option. And then you can book it right into your package. 
and it kind of feels like everything's kind of all inclusive and taken care of for you. So yeah, especially those with families who have multiple people, sometimes Uber is a little more difficult to accommodate that, as well as strollers, those things. So this is a van sized vehicle. They're used to transferring people. Um, so they'll be able to accommodate you and whatever needs you have and get you back and forth safe and sound. Yep. Sounds good. Great. Well, that does it for this week's Did You Know by the Mouse and the Muggle. Have a good day. Thank you very much for that. And yeah, that, that's actually, I think, better than Uber as far as round trip prices go. Really? Uh, especially, yeah, especially during peak times. You know, you're you're going you're gonna to spend a lot more than $25 each way during a peak Uber ride. Did they say $52 per person? Oh, per person. That's true. I guess it depends on how many people you're going with. True. Mm. Like for yeah. as a family of four, it would cost us like two hundred dollars just to. Uh, uh, I'd like, uh, no, so Uber would probably be cost effective for you there, yeah. but yeah, there's a lot of different options getting back and forth there. So absolutely, you know, it it's a, always good to know all the options. Yeah, you know. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, another. Well, I was going to say a little piece of news, but it's pretty big. Actually, it is. Yes. <laughs> uh, permits have been filed for Nintendo Land. Woo! Yeah. Uh, WFT. WFTV has reported that permits have been filed for the demolition of Kid Zone at Universal Studios Florida, and the construction will start in early 2018 and be completed sometime in 2021. Uh, feels like a long time away, but it's really yeah. not that far. Three and a bit years. Well, three years. Yeah. Yeah. Plan show Super Mario Land would include Donkey Kong and Mario Kart. So uh, this 8.8 acre expansion known as Project 487 will see most of Kid Zone replaced and will also include the, the area behind Simpsons used for the new area. Uh, the plans show that the E.T. adventure will remain, which should stop much speculation. Uh, it also showed that the entrance uh, to E.T. would be moved as well. So we'll see how that pans out. Did it say where it was going to move it, Darren? Um, well, I, I'm... I think it was to the front of the uh, show building, like over by the media center, the, you know, so it, it wouldn't be like actually back in the Nintendo area. So be more in the Hollywood area ish. Right. Yeah. Like as far up as you can get there. Yeah. I think a lot of people speculated that when, when Nintendo was rumored to be going in there, that's, that's what they would do anyway. Cause it gives you yeah. freelance to go in and, and put, use the entire of kids on at that point. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about it though. And like you're thinking about ET and Nintendo and everything. And I kind of put those in the same era in my mind. Yeah. Or out. Of it. But uh, WFTV also reported that Nintendo attractions could be coming to islands of adventure islands of adventure as well as the expansion coming to the recently purchased 500 acres of land further down the road. So here's a quick question for the pair of you. Then if we see Nintendo, attractions going into islands where are they going to go toon lagoon. toon lagoon that's the first place obviously comes yeah. to my mind yeah lost continent and toon lagoon but i think lost continent's too close to harry potter and i don't think you want them. i think they're going to want a bigger area than than yeah than the lost continent as well it's... well we know what's going in there anyway it's uh how to train your dragon mm. yeah <laughs> <laughs> how to train your dragons just going in everywhere that's yeah right. yeah well, it's funny because um, Mark, who we had on last week's show, has spoken to someone who is working on the development of Super Nintendo World out in Japan, I'm assuming. And um, the guy has ridden, he told Mark that he'd ridden the um, Mario Kart ride multiple times and said, told Mark, it was amazing. <laughs> cool. I already have what? They already have it done somewhere. Uh, it certainly sounds that way. Wow. Um, what it entails, I don't know, because there's a lot of speculation that it'll use that drifting effect that we saw. Per, uh, the permits yeah. filed for that. Um, some sort of augmented reality as well. Wow. Um, yeah. I just hope it's not screen. But from what we've heard about that as well, the 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 guys at Nintendo have been very adamant that they don't want it to be. They want it to be a lot, uh, as much practical as they possibly can do. So, yeah, which is good. Yeah, I don't want them to take it out completely because of all the complaints and everything. Though, if it will make an effect better or yeah. something like that, like yes. if, if it will make drifting around a corner feel like you're going 100 miles an hour. Yeah, that's a good point. 
that kind of thing. Like I would like to still see those used in that way, you know, just use them the right way and also have yeah. a lot of practical effects as well. well. Like I said, you look at something I've always said for me that the pinnacle of that screen and physical thing is forbidden journey. And you look mm-hmm. at the, the bits they mm-hmm. use the screens for in that ride, you couldn't do physically. no, and you yeah. do feel like you're flying along in a broomstick yeah, and you're sure. swooping and, and it's wow. surprising that, that you're not actually moving. It's bizarre. Yeah, because your stomach yeah. still lurches. Oh, and, even yeah. worse yeah. now. But yeah, that's when you, it, they've yeah, got to be used right. to do something that you couldn't do effectively physically. Yes. Right. Yeah, I think that'll be pretty good. And then we, if you do remember the uh, um, filings we saw for Donkey Kong a, a long time ago, was the like minecart ride. Oh, with the like the actual ride vehicle is well below you, yes. and your vehicle is kind of like attached to that, and yeah. so you can jump from track to track. Yeah, so because it was on the track and, was way below, wasn't it? And it was on like an elbow, yeah. like right. suspended above it. So that yeah, so you're actually like probably about I would say like fifteen twenty feet above the track. Yeah, and All right. you're on this like simulated track underneath you. Which can have like gaps and things in it because you know you're on that track underneath. That sounds so awesome. It can look, like you're, look like your cart's jumping from track to track, which is <laughs> which was like a big part of the Donkey Kong Country games. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's really cool to simulate that. Now, if only they could launch us from barrels. Yeah. But um, I think that's I, I I think that'll be a really neat practical ride as well. Yeah. You know, but they could do that all practical effects if you're doing a mine cart kind of thing. Yeah. You do not need to really put screens on that at all. So it'll be interesting to see because obviously when you think Nintendo, it's all it, it's video games, it's interactive. I wonder yeah. what sort of interactive elements these will have because they've that's what people crave from rides now. They don't want it doesn't it people don't want a passive experience. They want an interactive experience, yeah. especially when right. you're you're effectively, you know, Universal was always ride the movies. This is now going to be ride the video games. Yeah, and you don't want to yeah. be. When video games are inherently interactive mm-hmm. so what elements will guests be able to uh, I can't think of the word I want to use but that what input will they have into the ride rather than it just being a passive experience yeah. that'll be interesting to see yeah but in saying that you know that any interactive element will be a screen based thing <laughs> yeah because there's no way they can practically include your name in anything. No. And then, so they have like carvers, carvers backstage working really hard. <laughs> yeah. Or whatever they can do augmented reality wise. Yeah. But it's yeah, interesting. It's interesting that they filed these permits. I think we, we commented a couple of weeks ago that it seemed like any sort of work going on had kind of stopped. You know, we'd heard Barney was continuing on and it all yeah. seemed to have just kind of died a death and no one was talking about it. and then the next thing bang you've actually mm-hmm. you've got actual permits in for for the demolition of kids zone yeah and still, I, I feel like it's been that way in the past with construction universal too it's like they like hint and let something you know let the information out about it and then they don't talk about it until they're ready to go yeah. and then it's like here it is here's the permit and we're closed <laughs> see you later yeah cuz potentially they you know we're thinking that they've just put the permits in now ready for it they're probably 3 months down the line if not more already yeah and the yeah, fact i'm that, sure yeah. as soon as the holidays are over is probably when yeah the, they'll be yeah. looking to get yeah. going with that because after that you see an extreme drop in attendance for the parks for january february march so that's probably why they've, they've left it open for when it is just to give kids crowds uh, like guests with kids and s- somewhere else to go yeah. on i still feel quite sad that we've never really been in there yeah no and we had one that was the right edge yeah, say that every time we've never been down past woody woodpecker's nut house coaster i don't think no we did we had to walk and a look and then Halloween turned around <laughs> yeah yeah i was gonna say you went through the queues and horror nights yeah that's saw. about it <laughs> sad really and it? it's weird mm-hmm. for the to think that there is an area of that park that we've never really been in I know. when you consider yeah. what we do well, there's not much back there. Yeah. Anyway, well, you've so. got the excuse, Darren. You haven't got kids, but we've been three times with <laughs> with kids. <laughs> and one of them at one point, like Tracy said, was old enough really to have got the most well, young out enough. of me. <laughs> young enough, old enough, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. Too late now. <laughs> Bad pair. <laughs> It'll probably be gone by the time we get back out there. I to be honest. Probably guarantee that unless you're going to show up this, <laughs> this month. <laughs> Surprise. From an early age, she was always... <laughs> This is Tim. So yeah, but I think it's like a, yeah. the ball factory and the other water stuff. She'd have she'd have she'd a like pair that. of them, but had a blast in it. Actually. She was bored by Woody Woodpecker's Nuthouse Coaster. It was garbage. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> anyway. All right. All right. Well, let's take a break here for a second and uh, listen to some little things from Seth. Hi, everyone. This is Seth Kaversky from the Unofficial Guides here with the very last edition of all the little things that are new around Universal Orlando for 2017. Let's start in CityWalk, where permits have been filed for construction of Voodoo Donuts to replace the Element Skate Shop. The windows of the skate shop are blacked out, uh, so that's a good sign that construction is going to be moving forward for that donut shop to open in the new year. Oh, yes. Let's head into Universal Studios Florida, where the meet and greet for Krusty the Clown and Sideshow Bob has been moved from up against the wall near Quickie Mart to the adjacent queue for the Simpsons ride. It provides a more orderly line for the meet and greet and uh, makes for a much more efficient situation. Right around the corner from Springfield, the Back to the Future car has received an automated photo op, similar to the one in Jurassic Park. You can use your My Universal Photos card to uh, get a photo taken with the Back to the Future card if you don't have someone there to take a photo for you. Over in Islands of Adventure, Universal has announced a new Marvel character dinner that's going to be happening in the evenings at Cafe Four in Marvel Superhero Island. It costs $50 for adults and $25 for kids. Unfortunately, annual passes are not accepted for that. In other character dining news, the Caribbean Carnival held at Sapphire Falls is moving from Wednesday nights to Friday nights, effective December 8th. And finally, any new mothers flying in or out of Orlando International Airport may be interested to know that nursing stations have been installed now in all of the terminals. Look for them when it is feeding time. That's all for 2017. I'll be back in the new year with more little things around the Universal Orlando Resort. Until then, this is Seth Kaberski from the Unofficial Guides, Touring Plans, Attractions Magazine, and Orlando Weekly, wishing you a very happy holidays and new year. Darren, how excited are you to go and check out that Back to the Future photo op thing? I'm pretty excited. I hope there's a way to still do it without having the photo pass thing. It's it's really cool because it's sort of situated to the side of it, so you, you get like a side-on view of the car when you get the picture taken. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, I, I really like that. So, yeah, I definitely want to get one. We we have uh, uh, you know, ugly Christmas sweaters that are Back to the Future. <laughs> awesome. So we, we wanted to go do our Christmas picture there. Oh, that's perfect. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll see. You know, I'll go check it out and report back. But it, it, I really like that because it means that they're gonna you know keep maintaining the vehicle there and keep it there. And great point. Um, they have to keep it in in good shape to be in the photos as well so i wish they had more photographers around you know they make such a big deal of the my universal photos yeah. package but it's the majority of its ride photos i want to see more like roaming photographers like yeah. you do with disney yeah especially since like the fun one like the simpsons one you know went away yeah yeah you know, you'd hope that they would increase the uh you know the more walk around ones and i think i have seen more than than usual especially during horror nights um, you know, like when you guys came, uh, they had the one out front of like the Shady Brook scare zone, yes, and that kind of thing. I think uh, during this year, I saw like four or five of those okay. ones. So, so that that was cool. Because I'm surprised they haven't the, the ideal place for me to put a photographer, and I know it'd be a little awkward because they get busy. But the approach to the castle in Hogsmeade. And as you walk through the wall with uh, the Gringotts dragon in the background, people would go mental for those pictures. For an actual professional sort of my universal photo, like a proper thing, people would pay a fortune for that. And and you would you would have lines of people want to do it. And that's probably why they haven't done it in diagonally. But you think it's it's yeah. money for it. It it's pure profit because your photographer is not going to cost you that much. It's digital photography, so it's not like you've got film or anything. Yeah, true. Very true. I think so. I'm missing out, but there you go. What do we know? Yeah, voodoo donuts. Oh, yeah. oh, can't, can't wait for it. It's killing me. <laughs> killing me. Down to me like, yeah. any producers club money going? I need to check out voodoo donuts. Is any producers club money going? It's gone on a flight for me to go and check out voodoo donuts. No, I wonder how 
I wonder how they'll fare in um, the US airmail no, service. Be still. <laughs> yeah. For a week. Don't know about no. that. Or we could just get someone we know going over to buy us one of each and bring them back. Oh, there you go. That'll probably be a lot better for yeah. you. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll pledge to do a video where I try each and every one of them. That would actually be really cool. <laughs> Facebook Live. Yeah, that would be awesome. Three different kinds. <laughs> probably die on the stream. We'll see. You need to wash uh, it down with a frozen butterbeer. Yeah. Diabetic coma. Right. <laughs> well, I think it's about time for the main event, guys. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, for all, well, we'll just have a little ad here, and then we're going to listen to Lee and Tracy interview Mike Aiello about the holidays at Universal Orlando. Hey, you. That's right, you. Doesn't listening to the crew at UUOP every week make you wish that you were actually at Universal Orlando Resort? Well, stop wishing and start doing Mouse and Muggle Travel Company is the perfect place to begin. Their team of concierge-level travel planners will help you every step of the way. From finding the right fit for your family and budget to customized itineraries and insider tips, they can handle it all. Even if a hiccup that is up to no good arises during your trip, Mouse and Muggle Travel Company will manage the mischief for you. And for you muggles who also love the mouse, their team of experts specialize in Disney destinations too. And the best part of all, their services are free to you. So if you're ready to plan your next Disney or Universal vacation, let Mouse and Muggle Travel Company do all the work for you. Just go to mouseandmuggle.com and fill out a no obligation quote request. Or send an email to info at mouseandmuggle.com. It's that simple. So what are you waiting for? Just raise your wand and repeat after me. Accio, phone. Didn't work? <sighs> Muggles. Here, try some pixie dust instead. And remember, whether you're a mouse or a muggle, Mouse and Muggle Travel Company can help make your next vacation simply magical. Uh, we are pleased once again welcome Senior Director of Entertainment Creative Development at Universal Orlando Resort, Mike Aiello, onto the show. Hi, Mike. Hey, hey Mike. how's everybody doing? Good. We're great. How are you? Oh, doing really well. It's good to, to hear your voices. It's been and too yours. long since we've had you on, actually. It has. Yeah. I, I, it gosh, has. When, when was the last time? Refresh my memory. I'm sure it was Halloween uh, related, oh, right? Um, 2013, <gasps> I do believe. Oh, That's shocking. Has it been that long? I think so, yes. Oh my gosh, like 2013, that would have been uh, Halloween and right. probably New Lagoon Show. Yes. Yeah. I said, I've interviewed you separately on, some, on my other podcast, but for, for actual UUOP, that was, it was 2013, yeah. Yeah, oh my gosh. And we, but we did bump into each other, though, at, at the RIP tour. Yes. yes. That's right. I, yeah, I've seen you guys since then, but, uh, but yeah, yes. yeah, so officially yes. not on the podcast since 2013. All right, cool. We got a lot to catch up cool. on then. Which we, we have, do. yes. Yes. <laughs> right then. Um, so the holidays have arrived at Universal Orlando Resort uh, and this year sees some new elements added to the celebrations. So Mike, this year has to have been a great year to work on with so many offerings. Oh my gosh. So yeah, besides all the other projects that entertainment does uh, throughout the year, holidays for 2017 was a complete, really a complete redo of, 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 of our content. It is the largest um, uh, change in content that we've experienced for the holidays for, for, you know, for Christmas, man, probably in, in 10, 15 years between the, the new parade and all of the Harry Potter new Christmas overlays. It was a, it was a massive, uh, new era for the holidays at Universal Orlando. Yeah, definitely. I mean, cool. for a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, I'm a huge Harry Potter mm -hmm. nerd. So the biggest <laughs> thing this year has obviously been that stuff in, in the wizarding world of Harry Potter. And this is the first year, as you said, you've had chance to sort of play around in Hogsmeade and Diagon Alley with the, with the holiday stuff and the experiences. Let's not forget that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Mike, I know you're a, a big Potter fan as well. So you, you've got to have been excited when you finally got the news that they were going to let you go to town on it. Oh my gosh. It is like Christmas came early <laughs> for all of us, really, because yeah. um, being able to finally dive into that texture 
within the wizarding world, uh, like you said, has been something we've wanted to do for, well, frankly, since Hogsmeade opened in 2010. You know, you watch the films and you read the books and and every single book and and film touches in some capacity on the Christmas season. Uh, So it's been a part of that Mm -hmm. fiction, you know, since it came from J.K. Rowling's brilliant mind. And uh, and we've seen it in the films. We've seen how how amazingly vivid it is in the films. And for us to be able to finally be able to translate that into what we've created at the Wizarding World here at Universal Mm -hmm. uh, was something that, that, again, we we just could not wait to get started on. And uh, I'm really pleased with how everything turned out. I mean, it really... It was a massive effort from from hundreds of people um, to create all the different levels of, of content that exists within what we're calling Christmas in the Wizarding World. Mm-hmm. And it looks awesome. It really it, does. It does. You can, you can see the effort that's gone into it. Oh, I mean, yeah. you, you look at the, the, the new decor that, that's both in, in Diagon Alley and Hogsmeade and in London, frankly, um, mm-hmm. the... The one thing that we knew we had to do, looking at just because you think about, okay, it's it's decor, so how involved does that, does that have to be? Well, when you when you when you're doing that in the Wizarding World, there's an entirely different um, mindset you have to take um, that matches and can be just as authentic as everything that's in there already. Um, you know, it's even something as small as the, the decor couldn't look new. You know, even though we're saying it's all brand new decor, you, you know, in your head you go, okay, it's going to look like it's, it's just been put up, but, but that's not the case. Everything has been aged down um, to take on the quality as if it was in some fantastical trunk for the entire year, collecting <laughs> dust and mixed around with other things from the shop <laughs> and pulled out and maybe, maybe dusted off just slightly and then applied directly to the facade by either hand or by way of spell. Who knows how yeah. they did it? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> just, just like us muggles, keeping yeah. everything. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so you've got, you've got that, that very, you know, what would seemingly be a, a basic texture of just aging it. But then on top of that, uh, being able to apply the, the unique detail that each of the pieces take on depending on where they're placed within the Wizarding World. You know, I think, you know, some of my, one of my favorites, I think, is Glad Rags, you know, where you can, you, you see hints of Hermione's dress um, taking up some of the, the items within the, the garland decor itself. Um, oh, wow. Awesome. The, the, the Daily Prophet has this awesome kind of bronzed leaf texture that kind of over, overtakes the Daily Prophet sign. It is an organic element, but it looks almost like a statue. It's almost, it almost looks like a bronze statue. Um, to give kind of the regality that, that the Daily Prophet kind of takes on. So, yeah, I mean, every piece of Garland had an element of narrative story kind of placed to it, whether written or, you know, we've got some amazing designers that um, that applied mm-hmm. uh, their unique abilities to to really attacking each piece as its own element and telling that piece's story, just like the rest yeah. of, the, of the Wizarding World does. All of that had to really go into play to make sure that, felt as if it had always been there that, that that's the other important thing about about the we didn't yes. want it to feel <laughs> when you walk in that it's this brand new element that almost takes over it had to live with everything um even though we're mm-hmm. you know we're sitting here talking about it and and we're obviously we're marketing it because it is such an amazing thing but we wanted to make sure that it still felt realistic and as if this wasn't the first year that it had happened because again hogsby and diagon are living and breathing places when when we enter, mm-hmm. yeah, um, you know, we're 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 seeing a tangent of a day in the life. When we leave, that place is still alive. You know, mm-hmm. absolutely. I think it it's- could have been easy to get over excited and and go in and really go to town on the, on the decorations. And when you look at them, it's quite subtle and it really does fit in well to both areas. It does. And you were saying about the individuality of the garlands and the wreaths, which I have to say are my favourites. And, and Lil, you, you'll back me up. One of the first things when we did watch a, a YouTube video yeah. of the run-through was I immediately noticed that every storefront's decoration was different and tailored to each store, and I really appreciated that. That that got my inner geek happy. Well, yeah, and, that, and that's what we hope yeah. too, because the other thing is, is there are people going into the wizarding world that are going to engage it differently. You've got folks that... Yeah are very passive on the content. They, they have a, an awareness of it. And it, again, it's an amazing place to be. And they're invested while they're here. But then you've got fans like you and I who are going in 
And we're going to examine every single piece. We're going to look <laughs> yes. at it. We're going to um, <laughs> absolutely. We're going to marvel at it. We're going to ask questions as to why it looks the way it does. And that, that's the great thing about you know the world of of Harry Potter and and anybody that that loves it is you've got all different different types of people that are engaging it differently. And and the good thing about the type of content we create is we want to make sure it's accessible to everybody that that wants to engage mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And again, you're right. The, yeah. the, the decor yeah. is a very there's an elegance to it. There's a subtlety, but also an elegance yes. to it. Yeah. We didn't want to make it Vegas in there. You know, um, that, that's yeah. not that's not the Wizarding World. It is. It is. It has like it has a a very subtle elegance and class to it that we wanted to maintain, and and not be overpowering with it. It has to still feel real and and set within the story. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that you've you've changed up in the Wizarding World this year, and I, Mike, I've told you before, I'm a huge, huge yes. fan of the Frog Choir in Hogsmeade. Oh, I cool. think it's fantastic. Um, and it's great to see that you've given that a holiday overlay as well as obviously Stella Steen is set over in, in Diagon Alley. So it must have been great to sort of go in and, and revisit those two live attractions that you've worked on before and do something new with them as well. Absolutely. Celestina and her Banshees. Uh, you know, if Celestina, uh, well, I'm sure if she was an actual real person in our daily life day to day and not existing solely in the Wizarding World, I'm sure I would have received some sort of correspondence from her forcing me to give her a holiday show. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the diva of the Wizarding World would not have had it any other way. No. So that was very, I mean, we were compelled by that, by that story point that there's no way Celestina does not have a holiday album. It's just, there's just no way. So yeah. uh, again, it was a deep dive back into the fiction and trying to figure out what sort of songs could we create. But with the added challenge this time around is that we did not have song titles to go off of. Uh, when we created Celestina for Diagon originally, there were four very specific song titles that J.K. Rowling had created. Yes. Some are in the yeah. book. Some were featured in Daily Prophet newsletters that were sent to fan club members. Um, but this time around, there was nothing related to Christmas. So it was actually a very challenging exercise to... To come up with uh, many, like we, I think we had 25 song titles where we started. And that was it. We just started with the title um, and talked with Warner Brothers and the Blair Partnership. And, and we went back and forth trying to narrow down this list down to 15, down to 10, down to 6. And then ultimately, we landed on the four that we feature. Also because they represented potentially at that time, just by nature of the title, a certain type of holiday carol that could be associated with the title. Um, take Accio Christmas, uh, which is probably my favorite song in the entire set. <laughs> we, we just had the title. We just thought the words sounded really fun together. Again, you yeah. know, here comes yeah. Christmas, summon Christmas kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then with the added texture of we were, we were going back and forth on what type of song could it be. And I don't, I don't remember who it was, but, but, but the statement was made, well, what if it was the kind of the Feliz Navidad of the wizarding world? What if it took on that sort of texture? Um, and then that's where the kind of Calypso kind of texture kind of came out. And, and then um, Alan Zachary and Michael Weiner have been with me on, on both shows. They are amazing uh, music arrangers and lyricists. And they just started playing. Uh, Michael would get on the piano and start kind of plucking away and kind of figuring out some melodies. And Alan is a brilliant lyricist and just started coming up with words. And it's a very organic thing that starts to occur to start to figure out and, and identify these songs by nature of just the title. Um, and it's a really cool process, and, it, and it, it's very organic, and it's very, um, very uh, improvisational as well. Yeah. You know, and then we knew we wanted some sort of wintry ballad. We wanted, uh, uh, and we mm-hmm. love the title, Witch and Wizard's Wintry Wondrous Land, because that's another thing about <laughs> Celestina's songs is their titles can sometimes be tongue twisters. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. And even some of her lyrics identify that way. So we love this really long, extravagant title. But then when the song starts, it is a beautiful Christmas ballad that just evokes a uh, kind of sitting by the fire with family, with, with your loved one. You know, and the other really important thing about when we're creating any music in the Wizarding World is that although the lyrics will identify with very specific things that cater to the Wizarding World itself, we want to make sure that these songs can become almost, um, what's the term, uh, uh, like, like, like an earworm, uh, where you mm-hmm. hear this melody and you're, it's going to stick with you. Um, and then it becomes almost a song you'd listen to whether or not you're a Potter fan or not because it's still a really good song. You know, <laughs> and we didn't want to yes. inundate the lyrics with a whole lot of unneeded 
Potter isms, so to speak. We wanted to make sure mm-hmm. they still felt like real lyrics to a real song that could be in the Wizarding World or not. With maybe my baby gave me a hippogriff for Christmas being the one exception because there's not too many hippogriffs in reality. Um, but, you know, but it's still a fun song. That one is like our, um, uh, what is it? My, uh, what's the song? Um, I want a hippopotamus for Christmas. Yes. That's exactly what That's I said. That's what Tracy said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, or or um, even I saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus. That that kind of feel to yeah. that song. But all the others, yeah. I mean, it's just a ball. I mean, and then, you know, we get to create new new costuming for the girls. And we just wanted her to look to the nines. And then we've got a, she mm-hmm. casts a spell and snow falls now during the show. So it's just, a, it's a awesome. really great addition that really anchors the Diagon Alley portion of our Christmas overlay. But then you go over to Hogsmeade, and, and, and I'm so happy you're a fan of the Frog Choir because um, that was literally the first thing that I was able to create um, back in 2008 when we were trying to oh, figure wow. out how we design entertainment for Hogsmeade. And really right there was the entrance point of figuring out that music is so important, not only theme park, but, you know, Dumbledore even says the, the line, which has driven everything we've done musically, is that it's a magic beyond all we do here. That, that is Dumbledore's uh, yes, line. Point. And it's, it's true. Music is, a, is amazing. And, and creating the Frog Choir and having that happen, you know, day to day since that park opened. And now in Japan and in USH, all have their own Frog Choirs. But awesome. to give them a Christmas show was was awesome. I mean, it was really great to kind of infuse them with a new energy. Um, and I'm really happy with the 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 two new original songs that we've created, uh, Cast a Spell on Father Christmas and The Most Magical Yule Ball of All, uh, which are both very, very well done. And, and again, we've got a great, mm-hmm. great team of um, brilliant a cappella arrangers. Uh, Shalisa James and Jeremy James are just awesome. And they've been with me since day one of Frog Choir back wow. in 2008. Actually, Shalisa, a bit of trivia. She used to be a uh, Hollywood high tone in front of Mel's Diner when the park first opened. Awesome. Oh, that's so cool. Yep, that was her first job. She's been with this company in some capacity since this before this park even opened. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. She's invested in this place for her almost her entire life. And uh, and to be able to work with her and uh, and create the arrangements uh, for the Frog Choir has just been, been unbelievable. And they also do everything in USH as well, all the Frog Choir uh, casts in USH. They do that. Cool. Uh, so yeah, it's just been uh, between the decor and the, the new show overlays. It has been again everything that that we're able to create here at Universal for us. You know, being kind of in the mix with getting things you know created. It's like a toy box, and you're just lucky to to be able to unlock it. You know. <laughs> no, yeah, no. Yeah. I would love to trust <laughs> <Yeah>. me. <laughs> um, so, so the piece de resistance is the wisdom world in the wisdom world has to be the magic of Christmas at Hogwarts Castle experience. That's a tongue twister for me for some reason. Go, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, now, having only seen it on YouTube, sadly, I am trying to get Lee to take me. Um, we can only imagine what it's like to see in person, but from what we've seen on the screen, it is. St- Dunning. Mike, I was sat there watching it in tears. You were the just only watching one. it on the TV. I was oh. I was coughing in a manly way. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Oh, that, yeah, um, that castle show, it's really our first major foray into into map projection here at Universal. Um, yeah. Now we, we did we did um, kind of delve into it on a on a less technical basis when we opened Hogsmeade back in 2010. We did a a registered projection moment for the grand opening. And that one was really more about um, allowing the castle to reveal moments directly from the film. Like you, you would literally see mm-hmm. the castle kind of break away and create an opening. And then you would see, you know, Daniel Radcliffe adds Harry, you know, in a scene from the film, which is a great way to kind of engage our first step into the wizarding world, letting everyone know this is the brand and this is what uh, Hogsmeade represents and Hogwarts represents. But for this show, we didn't want to, take a fourth wall stance at the, at the fiction that would go against everything that has been put into Hogsmeade and Hogwarts. When you enter that you are now within the world, you're not an outside um, party looking in at it. You are within it. So for us, the very first step was attacking the, the, the content in a manner that allowed us to remain as citizens, so to speak, or villagers within Hogsmeade. Or, or, or mm-hmm. even standing in front of Hogwarts itself within the film. We are a character. And what would we see? What would happen on that castle for Christmas um, that, w- that would still keep the castle as a character and not simply a surface to project on? Yeah. yeah. And that was very important. Um, 
And the first step in that, honestly, was what is the guest going to see when they round the corner coming from Hogsmeade and rounding that, that left-hand turn? What is their new view of the castle? Because when, that, when Hogsmeade opened in 2010, not only did people, you know, their knees got weak when they entered through the archway, you know, seeing the, the train, <laughs> but then there was this equal emotional reaction when you finally got that reveal of the castle, um, just as the castle as it is. So our challenge was, before we got into any show content, is what does the castle need to look like during Christmas? So when they round the corner, yeah. before they even see any content, any show content, what is going to make them weaken the knees again, um, even though they may have seen the castle mm -hmm. before? And I got to say, and we worked with a company called Moment Factory and, and ThinkWell, again, two partners that I've, I've, I've been with mm -hmm. for, for a while now, um, yeah. who they're the real kind of geniuses behind the mathematics involved with the map projection. Um, yeah. And what they what were we able to create as far as applying the snow to the rocks and the snow to the castle, it looks real. You round that corner and you honestly believe that we have constructed new elements onto the castle. I mean, I can I can I honestly say it, it looks that good. Wow. Now there's all kinds of technical things that are allowing it to look that way and and cuz that yes. is yeah. not I'll be I'll be honest with you, it is not an easy piece of architecture to map. There are so oh, no. so many textures involved and so many angles. Um, it's 24 total projectors that kind of exist around Hogsmeade and the the stage area and even a, a position behind uh, Hippogriff. Uh, but again, 24 total projectors and, and some that are actually embedded within the castle itself to be able to get us the architecture that's more um, deeper into the castle. Uh, so that, that when you look at it, you're seeing the entirety of the castle affected. So the technical requirements are huge, but the it was the content mm -hmm. really, because again, when you when you also think of Christmas in the Wizarding World, um, there are some things that come to mind. But how you create you know a, a six to eight minute experience doing only Christmas presented us with a unique challenge, and there are some bookmarks that you can kind of dog tag in, in, into into the novels and, and 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 earmark you know that fairies make up most of the light in a lot of the decorations. The Yule Ball is yeah. a, is an event that happens. Yes, during Triwizard, but also during Christmas of the Triwizard mm -hmm. Tournament. Uh, you know, the, the idea that, that, that owls carry gifts into the castle. So you, you've got these textures that, that exist, but how do you kind of pull it all together? Uh, for me, mm -hmm. everything starts with music. Um, it's what I did on, on our, our previous Lagoon show for the 100 Years of Universal. Before there's any yeah. visuals done, I like to try and figure out what is the soundtrack to this show? What is the emotional value and honestly, with this version, what textures give us a Christmas feel knowing that we didn't want to do Jingle Bells, but done in the Wizarding World. We didn't want to do Silent Night. We wanted to still maintain a level of the scoring that exists in the films because it's so beautiful. But what visual can then we attach to it that makes it Christmas? And now, mind you, there are some amazing tracks that John Williams created that, that are directly Christmas feeling. Uh, Hogwarts yeah. at Christmas is an amazing track that we, we feature in the show. Uh, but again, the Yule Ball has the Potter Waltz that we can attach to and create a moment there. So it was creating the kind of the eight minutes or so of music that provided us with our emotional um, journey just auditorily. Again, if I couldn't hear yeah. or if I couldn't see anything, what am I hearing that makes me feel the jubilee of Christmas? What makes me feel the mm -hmm. romance of Christmas? What makes me feel the fun and excitement of opening gifts on Christmas morning? You know, which is kind of the where the Weasley section kind of started because, uh, you know, it, the Weasley moment, although not inherently Christmas, is still very much about packages and and the opening yeah. of packages. Yeah. Uh, and also, you know, for us, it was there's no way the Weasley brothers would not have used this as a way to market their shop. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. It's completely <laughs> so in their Weasley nature. Away. <laughs> <laughs> they have a captured audience, you know. It's like, what spell yeah. can we cast that, that tells everybody, hey, we've got this awesome shop in Diagon. Uh, you know, you, you should go buy some things. Because they do it on the train. Absolutely. You know, they, they, yes. they, they, oh, yeah. they do it on the train when you're, when you're moving back from, from Hogsmeade to Diagon. So, and I, I know I a bit of trivia. The show originally started as two separate shows. It was going to be two different moments that were both shorter in length. Um, there was going to be one that okay. was entirely Christmas related and one that was mainly Weasley Christmas related. Um, and we kind of strayed away right. from it because we wanted to create one show knowing we wanted as many people to see the show as possible. We were really concerned that if we did two different shows, nobody would move. 
You know, they'd see the first one, uh, yes. and they'd wait 20 minutes and see the second one, you know. So we, mm-hmm. we really combined it into two moments, which, which gave us a better experience. Yeah. Um, you know, my overall, the holiday celebrations at Universal look amazing this year, as they always do. I mean, obviously, you've got Grinch who's returning in Islands of Adventure. We've got the lovely Mrs. ILO performing right. in Universal Studios, Florida, with the backing of Mannheim Steamroller, of course. Mm-hmm. That's right. Uh, and we've also got the all-new uh, holiday parade feature in Macy's. So with the parade being entirely new, what made this year the year to change up the parade? And what's that process been like? Um, it really stemmed off knowing that that... that Potter was going to be such a major element, um, but also because of the the castle show being kind of a real big anchor for islands, we knew we wanted a really big anchor for the studios. We want our guests yeah. that are that are coming, you know, multiple days to be able to um, have something a very large Christmas presence in both of our of our um, uh, you know both both the studios and islands. I want to say both parks, but now we have three. So uh, I, I, I'm not in that habit yet. <laughs> uh, but definitely yeah. islands and studios, you know, are, are, are our Christmas content. So for the studios, the parade yeah. was a natural um, examination of well, what can we do to improve it, um, to, to, to bring it more into, into contemporary feeling, um, more to fit in line with parades that we featured 365 during the day. The Superstar Parade kind of presented us when we created that with a new, uh, a new uh, bar, so to speak. Uh, we really wanted to create floats that were self-propelled. We wanted them to have their own audio system. We wanted them to have their own lighting system. And then that, that sort of grew into, well, we kind of really want to start featuring some characters that, that are synonymous with the Universal Orlando brand. And, but we, we also wanted to continue the relationship with Macy's. So how can we mm-hmm. collaborate on this new vision of what a Universal holiday parade that features Macy's, what can that be? And what started as maybe changing a couple floats really turned into we're going to change the entire parade. We're going to we're going to we're wow. going to rebuild from the ground up a brand new experience mm-hmm. for our guests, from the floats to the characters to the costumes to the soundtrack. Um, we're going to we're going to we're going to redo everything. Um, you know, we've been with Macy's for I believe over fifteen years now, and it wow. really felt time knowing that Potter was such a brilliant anchor for the studio for the islands. I was the adventure that that we need to do something just as dynamic for the studios, and it it kind of grew into this amazing Christmas monster that it is now. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's cool. It is. And that's the thing. It's- the technology, the technology's changed so so much since that parade first came about that it's allowed you to do different things now. Mm-hmm. Like you say, with the the self powered vehicles and things like that, it gives you a different option. Yes. And uh, I'm hoping that one year I will get Lee to take me. <laughs> it will happen at some point. Or maybe I'll take Lee. Y- you there know we what? go. Be, be your own person. <laughs> Absolutely. That would be cool. In fact, if, if just one goes, it's cheaper. Yeah. So there. <laughs> you can go on your own. Whatever. Get on with you. So, yeah, so, so obviously, Mike, I hope you are really proud of yourself and your team for creating yet another fantastic holiday celebration for your guests. Uh, I'm, because I'm, it really is amazing. And just from this side, just seeing it through a screen, we really appreciate it. Oh, no, it, it's, um, it's our pleasure. I, I'm, I'm, I'm super proud of the team. You know, they're, we've got good. some amazing people that, that give everything they have to be able to, to present what we've got and do it um, within the time we have to do it. I mean, there, it, it is yeah. a... This is a lifestyle for for hundreds of people, you know, and and it, it is it's Absolutely. an amazing experience, and it's something that uh, I'm just I'm just happy to be collaborating with such amazing, talented people every single day. Excellent. Well. It's about time, I'm afraid. Yes. Um, so it, it has been an absolute pleasure, as always, to have you on the podcast, Mike. Um, we won't leave it as long next time, I promise. Yes. <laughs> um, and we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule, especially at this time of the year, to Absolutely. chat with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, the pleasure's mine. It was really great talking with you all again. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Merry sure. Christmas. Yes. Ma- Merry Christmas to you too. Quite there yet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that wraps up another unofficial Universal Orlando podcast. Thanks for listening. Between shows, please subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes. It really helps. But if you're not an Apple user, you can find us on Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, or wherever great podcasts are found. Head over to our blog at uuopodcast.com for show notes, articles, and more. You can get in touch with us by emailing podcast at uuopodcast.com or leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash uuopodcast. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube. Just search UUO Podcast. 
And if you're planning a trip to Universal Orlando or Walt Disney World, please check out our sponsors by going to mouseandmuggle.com to book your next trip. Well, that's a wrap. See you next week.